practice on something specific. So we have three guest speakers and there'll be panel discussion and there'll be food. So come along next Monday for free at six. In South Wales. Good to go. Just try a few questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good. Okay. Should be fine. And yeah, so when you're ready, you can, if you just press all displays, you can press your hand. that one, yeah. all the displays. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 and if you want to change the lighting, uh, you can do that as well. If you want to do the thing to make it the the lighting. Be like, so if you go here, yeah. and if you press movie, it will like show dim the lighting. Here, so it's easier to see. Can I try it now? Yeah. Oh, can I have a try and lecture? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. <coughs> Oh, well, I don't like this. How do I? I don't like the, I don't like the spotlight. Uh, spotlight. Uh, hmm. Maybe I'll just do this. Yeah, for now. Yeah, yeah, if it's not clear. Yeah, I think the way we just say it. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Tom. No worries. Can we just give you a little introduction or oh, mm, up to you? I can right. do it myself. Alright, I'll just go. Sure, sure. Sure. Hi everyone. I think we'll make a start. So thanks for coming along to our second revision lecture of the year. Uh, for Peds Gastro Surge, we have Laval Chu, so make him welcome. Can everyone see the toilet? So hi, for those, um, those of you who don't know me, my name is Laval. It's a very weird name. I'm, I'm currently in my fifth year doing my cardiothoracic surgery in Alfred. Um, I'm always interested in surgery. Uh, just a bit of introduction of myself. Take one minute. Um, always in, interested in surgery since the um, first year I got to do mass school. I was initially interested in congenital heart disease. I was really attracted by it. So I thought, um, what is I was thinking, what is the pathway of getting into do the actual congenital heart disease? Is something really specialized? Is it P search and that, is it pediatrics and then surgery and then cardiothoracic or is it the other way around? And I found it's only you can only do it by going to going through um, cardiothoracic search and then P's and then specialize in P's. And then I realized I don't uh, I actually like a lot of other things as well, neurosurge, plastic, ophthalmology. Um, but then after a while, I realized what I like the most is kids. So, <laughs> I realize a combination of surgery and kisses is what I like the most. So um, I'm also the uh, academic rep of Muppets this year, the Pediatric Society, as some of you guys would know, Pediatrics. So um, there will be more resources on Pediatrics coming, so keep an eye on that. Uh, just a bit of promoting, I'm also running the idea vision this year. So for those of you who want to make your CV looks a bit nicer, want some voluntary experience or whatever, contact me if we have um, one Clinical services for high school and ophthalmology workshop running this year. It's all brand new. You can come help out. And for those who don't want to volunteer, you can also come and find out more about ophthalmology. And I'm also the rep for critical care. We're running a workshop. Again, you can come help out and um, I'll just assign you some volunteering groups. So let's go. Firstly, we have our first baby, Helen. <clears throat> she was born in a regional hospital immediately after birth. She presented with persistent tachypnea and cyanosis. So breathing really fast, with a really fast heart rate. Any thoughts? DDAs. Can I just get some hands on to show me who are doing PEATS or who have done PEATS? <laughs> it's okay, I'm gonna ask everyone questions, so just put your hands up. Done PEATS, done PEATS, done PEATS. Okay, let's start from the very back, the girl in the blue. Um, any thoughts? It's okay. Um, I'll also give you the examination here. You can see intercostal um, retraction, grunting, breathing, respiration, scaphoid abdomen. Does everyone know what is scaphoid abdomen? So, scaph um, this is my head, this is my thorax, my 
abdomen. So scaphoid abdomen is like a downward curving of, this, um, of your abdomen. And uh, um, so I'll, I'll come back to explain this later. So this is actually, does anyone, does anyone know what this is? Yeah, well, um, that's really good. Um, can you explain why you think this is CDH? You can see the Perfect. Perfect. Yep, so this is the congenital diaphragmatic hernia, as you can see here. Um, all the bowels, all these bowel gas are going up to the chest cavity. And can someone describe to me, apart from the bowels herniating, herniating up to the thorax, any other features that you can see? The back row? The most prominent features? Back row? <laughs> Apex <beta. laughs> Yeah, so you can see the heart is greatly displaced. It. And what about the lungs? Look at how tiny this lung is. So these these bowels are actually pushing all everything towards the other side and also causing an increased intrathoracic pressure to prevent them from developing intrauterously. So CDH, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, some signs and symptoms that you must know is respiratory distress within the first few hours or minutes that would not improve, so it persists. So some of the other causes of res respiratory distress that you might have learned in previous um, neonatology lectures, some of them can improve, some of them can improve easily while you give oxygen or whatever treatment, but this one, it wouldn't improve no matter what you do. Um, you can, a lot of times you see cyanosis because there are pulmonary vasculature and the pulmonary structure is just very poorly developed. Um, scaphoid abdomen, as I described, and also the barrel shape of the chest. So what you see is actually, if you think about everything just pushing upwards to the thorax, the thorax is going to grow big and the abdomen is going to look smaller than it should be. So scaphoid abdomen, barrel shape of the chest. And also when you auscultate the lungs, obviously you will you will not hear any lung sounds on the left side and you might even hear some bowel sounds. So um, you don't have to know in detail, but just know that most commonly it's the posterior lateral, also called the broccolet hernia, and also another type of the morgani, morgani hernia in the anterior um, part of the diaphragm. So what investigation if you are suspecting a CDH, right? Chest X-ray and yep. So X-ray, obviously, because as, as I have shown you, um, is there any way that we can diagnose this? Diagnose this earlier. Yep. So ultrasound scan. So you like women, so you probably know this. So um, ultrasound can actually only diagnose about fifty percent of the case because of maybe like um, the skills required to diagnose this condition. And obviously, you do um, chest X-ray or echo and other usual blood tests you would do. <clears throat> So management is surgical, you can't do anything. You can just manage it conservatively. And complication is pulmonary hypoplasia. Um, so even these um, babies are treated, surgically treated, they might still suffer a long time from um, the hy pulmonary hypoplasia. They might require a lot of oxygen supplement. And so some other extra information that you should know in terms of a conservative management is um, ABC. So just do your normal ABC resuscitation ventilation. Um, do you know um, something special about this condition in terms of ventilation? So normally you learn about neonatal resus last time, right? Last lecture. You give mass, give oxygen, positive ventilation, pressure. And can you do this in CDH? <coughs> so obviously the answer is no, because if you are giving a mask, you're basically pumping air into the esophagus, pumping into the bowels, and this is just gonna you know, expand and then worsen the whole condition. So in this case, you must intubate the baby. So this is the case that you have to intubate, have to get experienced um, neonatologist or any to intubate. What's this ECMO? No, no, should have learned this in, yep. Yep, well done, so extra corporeal corporeal membrane oxygen, basically meaning that, do you know what it means? Yep, perfect. So basically it's a machine that helps you breathe and um, perform the function of the lungs because of the pulmonary hypoplasia. And also you would like to insert an NGT to um, decompress the valve. 
And obviously the kids has to be um, treated in neonatal ICU. So um, on most of these conditions that I'm gonna cover, I'm gonna have a one line, not one line, but like a short summary of all the key points that you have to know for this particular condition. I'm doing this because P-Search is a relatively small area in the Monash curriculum for your examination. So I'm not gonna go into all full burn or all details. I'm gonna make it sustained and simple for you guys to sort of understand. And for the next conditions, I'm going to ask you guys to make this summary for me. So our next baby. Seven month old baby appears to have intermittent distress in the past eight hours, curling up with legs thrown up, up to his chest, looking really uncomfortable, cry uncontrollably three to four times every hour, <coughs> looks pale during these episodes. Sick looking on examination, formative four times. Last moment was greenish. And um, the second row from the back, the ones with the fancy marble case, just like the one that I'm using. <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts? Just give it a guess. Have you done Pete's? So you can just tell me what you think. You don't have to tell me a definite diagnosis because obviously you might not know it. Yes, 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 you, you, you. <laughs> so abdominal pain, vomiting. Think about it as an adult. What sort of diagnosis would you be thinking? <laughs> anyone, anyone? <laughs> Intersusception. Yep. <laughs> so basically, you just think about this presentation. It's basically a bowel obstruction presentation. So even you don't know the diagnosis, you can tell me it's bowel obstruction. <laughs> Red jelly, and red jelly likes to, it's a buzzword, red jelly currents to. And um, the baby was sent right to radiology for an urgent ultrasound, and this is what you see. Um, okay, the um, Neri, want to describe to me what you see? <coughs> so this is an ultrasound. Yep, so it's a target sign, so you already know. So this is a um, target sign for intersusception. And um, for those who don't know what intersusception <laughs> is, basically is when you have one segment of your bowel intergenerating into another part of the bowel, looking like this. So the target sign just now was basically like a cross section. If you cut through here, and you will see the um, terminal ileum here, surrounded by the cecum. It's like Okay, so in pediatrics, it's really important to know your timeline because, in, especially in Monash exam, if, a con if you are thinking about a condition that is outside the time frame, it's not the condition. It must be, it must be fit within that time frame. So two months to two years old, taking five to nine months. <laughs> Symptoms is so usually um, commonly followed uh, by already upper respiratory tract infection, colicky pain, crying, curling up. So the baby looked really sick because it's really painful for them. Because if you think about it, essentially it's bowel ischemia, and you know from third year your bowel ischemia presentation, like mesenteric ischemia presentation. Um, vomiting can be bowel stained. It. Um, the, the guy <coughs> sitting there, can you tell me why is um, the vomiting bowel stained? It? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So where does this biliary tract insert to the bowel? Joins with the bowel. It's duodenum. So duodenum. Yep. So the second part of the duodenum. So um, anything, basically anything below that can give you spouse in it. Anything about that will give you normal vomit. As simple as that. And another buzzword, red currant jelly stew. Classical sign, but you rarely see it because it's a late sign, especially in a metropolitan <laughs> hospital, you probably won't see it because before <laughs> the baby gets that sick, they're already seen by doctors and treated. Um, get a bit of diarrhea as well, and it's commonly mistaken as a gastroenteritis. And other buzzwords, so they shift the mass in the right upper quadrant or an epigastrium. And um, for the babies who get perforation because of the ischemia and everything and build up of the pressure, they get perforation and they can get shot. So they have to be treated seriously. So um, 
what sort of investigation would you do? Yep, a dominant expert. And what would you see? Same as I'll just now. <laughs> yep, so you can actually see the same sort of target sign in chest, uh, in abdominal x ray as well. And also a crescent size. So basically, when the target is compressed by the surrounding tissue, it becomes like a crescent shape. So it's essentially the same thing. Plus, you do group and hold because the baby is really sick and there's a risk of perforation, and you definitely need to um, do fluid results and, and, um, and to treat the anemia if there's bleeding. And gold standard is still ultrasound, so not abdominal x ray. Um, so, guess enema is actually both an investigation and treatment, and it's commonly due. So, the baby, so it's actually a real case I encountered in um, MMC. The baby was sent to, so the baby presented in emergency, sent to the radiology, did the ultrasound, found the target sign. Everyone was convinced that it is, um, it is interception. So he was sent, sent to the, another radiology room where they have the equipment to do guest enema, and they have a few attempts. So does anyone know how many attempts you can do for guest enema? Or maybe you tell me what are the risks of an enema? Sorry? So perforation, because you're essentially blowing air into the bowel to try to dilate it. So you can do two attempts for one go, and you give it a rest, and you give it another go, another two attempts, and then do the third time. And if the third time fails, uh, sometimes even usually before third time, and then you send the theater for a surgical laparotomy to fix it, because you don't want the risk of um, perforation. And um, in terms of management, as I said, the enema and surgery, it failed. Obviously, conservative management for the sucks, analgesia, nail by mouth, NGT. Nail by mouth, NGT probably applies to 80% of your gastro conditions. So if you don't know the answer, just nail by mouth, NGT, broad spectrum, empirical IV antibiotics, just pretend that you know it. <laughs> Some extra stuff for you to know. Um, so as I mentioned, two months to two years is time frame, but you can actually get into subsection in adults or out of, outside the time frame. But it's usually, due to secondary to your leg point, and a leg point can be a merkel diverticulum, enlarge the lymph nodes, blah, 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 as you can see. And um, if you think about it, basically anything that is protruding from the bowel, or any mass or any solid that is abnormal can lead to intersusception. <laughs> okay, so do you want to give it a go? Give me a summary of intersusception. Very brief. I feel buzzwords, I just want buzzwords because that's what you need for exam. Rupert Hines loves buzzwords. Billy, Billy is forming. Billy is forming. And um, password, password. Is that with a red heart as well? As a light sign, yeah. Yeah. And um, if you feel the abdomen. Yeah, the abdomen. Um, you feel uh, this mass, uh, this sensation mass. Yep. On sensation. Uh, mm hmm. Um, as well as uh, this lesion, this baby on the left. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Okay, next person. Um, treatment, or uh, <coughs> treatment and investigation and treatment. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it's like something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's correct. Fantastic. <laughs> and the air animal is different as well. Perfect. Okay, next case. Baby peed off, five weeks old, multiple episodes of false vomiting. I think people who have done peace will immediately know what this condition is. So, baby appeared to be hungry between these vomits, small <laughs> sizes, looks really tired with signs of dehydration and an olive shaped mass palpable in the epigastric region. So, you, what do you think the diagnosis is? 
<laughs> Sorry? Yes. What was it, Dan? Was this? <laughs> no, okay, I'll ask you later. Kidding. Um, so the next person, do you know? So pyroxenosis, also known as um, olive obstruction. No, I'm kidding. It's not. Um, so basically, a hypertrophy of the muscles of the pylorus. <clears throat> and it's typically four to six weeks. Present with projectile vomiting. When I mean projectile, I mean here to there. It actually can be that projectile. And um, because nothing is getting passed through the stomach, nothing is absorbed in the intestine, the baby is really hungry all the time, full weight gain and dehydration as you would expect, and also a palpable olive shaped mass in the um, epigastrium. And um, this is actually, in fact, really palpable. And one, do you know what can you do to make it easy to palpable? The next person of the brain macro. Yeah, so you feed them, you sort of simulate some peristalsis and you will be able to go. You might be able to go. So what sort of investigation would you do? The next person? Um, so the episodic x-ray. Mm -hmm. um. <coughs> yep. And what about the basics? So oh, yep, yep, blood test. And do you know what will you see in a blood test? Or what sort of blood test will you order? So the usual things and do you, do you know if there's anything specific you might see? Or maybe think about electrolytes. If you if someone vomits a lot, keep vomiting, what sort of electrolyte imbalance would you expect? In a, even in an adult. Even in an adult, what do you see? Yep. Alkalosis, yep, metabolic alkalosis. Yep. What is that? Tell me. Yeah. 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 Um, yep. Yep. So it's hypokalemic, hypokalemic. So low CL and low K. So you do blood tests, hypokalemic, hypokalemic, metabolic alkalosis, and it makes sense because you're vomiting acid, you're vomiting out all your K plus, and um, imaging ultrasound. So Abdominal x ray, you probably still do just as a screening, but you'll never be able to see the um, hypertrophy because of the density. So you actually have to do ultrasound. And if it's more than three millimeters in terms of thickness, it's diagnostic, or a length wider than 15 millimeters. So it's a diagnostic. Other thing you can do very real upper GI, showing, showing the double check sign, but I don't think it's necessary. So this is the ultrasound. So this is the pylorus. So the thickness is here. So you measure this thickness and you measure this length, okay? So this is, again, another case that I actually saw in MMC. I took this photo while they are doing this surgery. Um, this is the olive shaped mass, the pylorus. So oh, I was going to ask you what is the name of the surgical procedure, but I already put it up here. So it's Renstep pyloromyotomy. Um, does anyone know what this? What does this surgery involve? One of the most simple surgery. Interestingly, um, the proposed treatment, surgical treatment, initially was actually to cut off the muscles, reduce the muscle mass, and then just seal everything together so the pylorus become become less bulky and things can pass through. But Ramsat, when he performed the surgery, he didn't stay didn't stabilize the baby. The baby was still in the state of hypokalemic, hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. So he just went on to do the surgery, he cut it, and then the anesthetists were telling him that, no way, this kid is going to die. You have to stop the surgery. We have to fix the um, medical side of the problem first. So he just sealed up everything. He just did not seal up the cutoff part of the muscle, but just close the abdomen and do everything. And magically, miraculously, the baby got well. So the thing is actually, you only have to relieve the pressure. You just have to make one simple cut there. You don't have to do anything else, all done. So it's actually um, something that he invented by mistake. And obviously you will do all the usual thing to resize and one of NGT again. <coughs> yep, so this is just showing you how, how you make an incision and the muscle will bulge out. Okay, next person, do you wanna give me a simple summary? Mm 
Perfect. That's all I want. That's good. So um, again, page search really don't have to know into that much of data. So that was a good, good summary. So for the cell term baby, did not prove. So the proof in baby newborn neonates is um, called meconium. So for those who don't know what is meconium, it looks like this. Pretty disgusting. Um, the next person, do you know what actually is meconium? <coughs> So obviously the baby haven't start eating. Yep, so basically it's a mix of all the mucus secretion, water and amniotic fluid. So yep, not, nothing to do with food content or anything. So this baby has bilious vomiting, abdominal distension, food feeding, bilious is right. Grossly distended abdomen, NPR showed it explosive rectal content. Fresh ones, yep, so this is probably the passwords for first one. So when you do a pre hour you can see. So this is the X-ray. How will you, this, the next person, how will you describe the, um, um, this X-ray appearance? The girl in black shirt? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's yeah, basically, that's right. Sorry? Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's probably not that significant. So basically, we will also call this um, foamy or bubbly kind of appearance, foam bubble appearance, just because you see a lot of bubbles out of the bowel lips. So Hirschsprung's disease, in terms of epidemiology, is one in 5,000. It's not that rare, not that common, but I see a lot in MMC with a mouth to gain ratio of 4.1 associated with Down syndrome. So these are all pretty buzzwords and things that you should know for exams. So it's an aganglionic a -ganglion segment, meaning that um, the parts of the bowel that are affected, the nervous tissues, the nerves tissues in within the bowel wall is not well developed. Does anyone know what is the um, nervous tissue called in the bowel? So the second year gastroenotomy. Yep. One more, there are two taxes. Submucosal taxes, yep, well done. Do you know what are their other names? Both of them have other names. I don't know why they have to be, give so many names. Uh, uh, don't worry, oh, we'll come back to this. Um, so main symptoms is delayed meconium, suspected of breeding in 48 hours. So 90% of babies will pass their first meconium within the first 24 hours, and 99% of them will pass within the first 48 hours. <coughs> so basically, anyone who doesn't pass after 24 hours you highly suspect there's something wrong you will um, learn a few more conditions later um proofreading fellows with like distended abdomen so the distended abdomen can be quite dramatic because there's a blockage everything is sort of pulled up and built up within the bowel um and because of the um normal external sphincter of the um anus there's actually kind of a locking effect at the anus and everything just build up about it. So when you do a PR, you're just releasing all this pressure and that's why you get the explosive um, content of P, uh, on the PR examination. Release vomit is pretty disgusting if you imagine everything backing up. Um, so some, so mostly they present in the newborn period because all the doctors are competent in making a diagnosis. But if this is missed, they can present as a kind of chronic constipation in the, a younger kid, like two to three year old kid especially for those who have a tiny bit of segments affected. So how do you investigate it? So, you know, abdominal x-ray, does anyone know any other investigation that you do or diagnosis? The next person. So imagine biopsy, yeah, you know what, what type of biopsy is that? So there's a specific type of biopsy called the um, rectal suction biopsy. This is a pretty clever invention. Basically, you don't have to um, you don't have to cut out everything. You just put a gun. This gun has a tube, has a straw, really tiny kind of straw goes into it, and this straw has a hole, and it is connected. The other end is connected to a syringe, and when you suck from the syringe, you're basically sucking the tiny tissue 
into that hole of the straw. And there's a blade within the straw to cut it. So basically you are sucking a tiny amount of the tissue and to cut it. So you avoid the need to um, perform an open surgery. And no one really does, uh, no one really do a manometry, like pressure manometry nowadays. Surgical resection is the definite treatment. So you don't really have to know this, but the common, the most common procedure is the Swenson's pull-through procedure. Basically what they do is they identify the segment, <clears throat> the length of the segment of the, um, of the aganglionic <coughs> again, um, segment, and then they will cut it up, <clears throat> pull it through, pull the um, normal part through, and then anastomose it again. So basically very simple. And um, these are the fancy names of the plexus. Okay, the next person, do you want to give me a really brief summary? Rectosuction biopsy. Okay, that's good. Fantastic. That's most likely what you have to know. And also, um, you can also say that one was a megacolon. Depends how people name it. Um, next case. Three days old term baby. No poop again. Really vomit. Abdominal dissension. Blah blah blah. So then, next person. What do you think? Um, Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's actually it's not what I'm thinking, but there's nothing wrong about what you're thinking. It's absolutely correct. So what I'm thinking about this case, if I show you this X-ray, does it change your thought? Um so for some uh, <coughs> mm, can you see a mal rotation or can you see something that suggests problems? Yeah, not really. Yeah. But anyway, what um your your details of um Dodino actually said was absolutely correct, but this case is just meconium eyelids. So basically it presents very similar to Hirschbrand's and this other thing called meconium plus syndrome. So, so I'll go through meconium eyelids first. It's hypopneumonic for cystic fibrosis, especially for Monash. If you see one, you know it's linked to the other, it's definitely. Um, basically, you know cystic fibrosis is the mutation of the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulated gene and um, causing, affecting two main systems, your lungs, which you should know, and your GIT check. So in newborns, all the meconium and everything become really thick and they just get stuck in the terminal eyelids. <laughs> and everything after the terminal eyelids, nothing's going through. So you, they sort of um, become, so the bubble will absorb all the water and it will just become really small and you'll see microcolon beyond the, um, beyond the site of obstruction. And in adults, you can get that as well. And it's called the DOS. So meconium plot syndrome is a bit different in terms of that. It's a bit similar to Hirschsprung's, but, but just that the actual nervous tissue is still there, but they are immature. So if you do a biopsy, you can still find all the nervous tissue, but they are not active yet. They're just immature. So if you suspect, you, you still have to do a retrosecond biopsy to sort of rule out. So that's why it's a diagnosis of exclusion. And um, it can be associated with maternal, maternal diabetes. So management is just um, using contrast enema, and if it fails, do surgery. So nothing much to sum up in this baby. We'll go on to the next one. <coughs> so baby Ellen, premature, started to vomit three hours after delivery, but otherwise appeared well, not in any distress, stable, ops, fearless vomiting, the same abdomen. What do you think? Any idea? Or can you tell me anything? Doesn't have to be diagnosis, but just what you are thinking. Where's the obstruction? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So this is what you see on abdominal X-ray. Does it give you any extra information? No, no worries. So what I'm seeing here. What do you think this is? Yep, so gastric bubble, what do you think this is? 
is a severely dilated something. Location-wise, what, what would this be? What part of bowel would this be? Duodenum. Yep, correct. So this is duodenum. This is gastric. So this is duodenum atresia. Atresia basically means like a complete blockage, but um, it's commonly used as a spectrum where you also have stenosis and web. So stenosis and web is not complete, and atresia is complete by definition. And um, if you have some part that is atresic here, everything is just going to block up, uh, sort of build up. The pressure is going to build up up there. So that's why you see the double bubbles here, where you see the duodenum and the gastric, gastric bubble and DA associated with Down syndrome. Must know because your hands like it. Uh, signs and symptoms, as, I, as you can see from the um, presentation. So it can be diagnosed prenatally. And the next person, can you give it a guess why, why do you see polyhygamias in these babies? Do you know what, uh, have you done wounds? Do you know what polyhygramia is? Yeah, too much um, amniotic fluid in the sac. So basically, um, during the uterus, uterus development, babies keep constantly swallowing all the amniotic fluid and sort of circulating. But um, when they have an atrial segment, things are not going, not going to pass through it. So you're going to build up of amniotic fluid outside <laughs> the body. So yeah, polyhydrosis. And um, the double bubble sign. Again, you can see, you can appreciate how nearby mouth NGT, how useful it is as an answer for all gastric conditions, if you don't know, if you have no idea. And surgery is basically just to cut off the bowel, cut off the part of the bowel that is atresic and anastomose the part of the bowel. And um, you don't have to know this, but the, there are three main types. The first type where you have uh, worm and stenosis, you can still see, actually there's a connection here, so things might still be able to pass through. The second one is just a very, very tiny, very atresic, nothing can really pass through. The third one is just a tiny fibrous cord or even nothing. Um, so, Geogenoic ileal atresia, it's commonly referred just as intestinal atresia and other things that you don't really have to know, but you can know that they exist. There are five different types, four different types. I personally like to remember some box words, Christmas tree, apple peel deformity. Okay, next baby. So the next person. Sudden onset dark green body, inconsolable crying. Yeah. What kind of obstruction? Which segment of the bar? Upper? What do you mean upper? Esophagus? Yep. Mm, I would think any, anywhere below that. Yeah. Yeah, because the bowel duct, what is the bowel duct insert in the bowel? Yeah, in the you know, so anything below that. Yep. So um, on examination, crew versus kept with field four seconds, descend abdomen. So what, what do these information tell you? <coughs> yeah, so baby is very sick, hemodynamic, hemodynamically unstable. So this is what you see on that chest x-ray, uh, abnormal, abnormal chest x-ray. So what is this? What is this? It's more bubble. <laughs> what is this sign called? Double bubble. So it's exactly the same as Dodino atresia, but this is not Dodino atresia. Someone mentioned that before, this condition. Um, I can't remember the mention. So it's malrotation with nuclear valvulus. <clears throat> So a little bit of embryology, which everyone hates. <laughs> Not gonna go into detail. You can um, YouTube it and watch the animations, but basically um, in, this is your bowel, the yellow bowel is bowel and all the vessels. It's gonna go into the uh, umbilical cord like this. And then if you look, sort of look from here, my eyes looking into, into here, and I'm gonna see an anti-clockwise rotation of this whole trunk of things. And you can see how these, these part is a small bowel developing, and this is a large bowel. And this is gonna rotate anti-clockwise for 270 degrees to become your normal anatomy things. So 
if you want to understand the whole rotation thing, it's really complicated. I don't recommend it because there's no way they can test you in exam. So all you have to know is anti-clockwise, 270 degrees. That's it. So for um, so the cause of this mal rotation is because there's a lat span developing, sort of connecting with the um, cecum and the peritoneum, causing uh, obstructing the normal rotation. So this fibrous span is just um, yeah, it's just an abnormal bend that exists in some people. Uh, and you can appreciate how the valve develop. So it's usually less than one year old and commonly in even younger baby, one month old. Um, Malrotation is kind of common, but a lot of them are asymptomatic. Only one in 6,000 can actually get a fibrous and becomes, um, become uh, symptomatic. And the onset is really set on really acute onset of bilious vomiting with um, a lot of pain in consolable crying because of imagine the twisting is just again causing bowel ischemia. A lot of abdominal distension, <coughs> but you won't be able to feel anything too, you know, too suggestive of, of anything. Signs of dehydration and also bowel ischemia perforation, and these are all late signs, which you will rarely see. <clears throat> what sort of investigation would you do? The next person. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yep, some sort of contrast. That'll be a good choice. And other any other basic things that you would do? Yep, what test? Would you expect to see anything? So yeah. So it's mainly a, yeah, it's mainly about a ski in your picture. So you will see like inflammation, white blood cell. Potassium, um, potassium is more to do with the um, ischemia, like a metabolic exidosis and lactate. Um, imaging, as you said, abdominal X-ray. Oh, I was going to ask you what you see, but uh, there you go. So you see the standard valves and the normal peritoneum as well if it's perforated. And the upper GI study, so the contrast that you mentioned, and you might also see cross growth kind of pattern. Okay. So, next person, how we manage it? Um, yep, well done. Okay. Yep. <laughs> um, yep, surgery. Do you know what surgery did you? Yep. So, it's named by the abnormal part of the fibrous brain. So, it's called the LAT procedure. You don't really have to know detail about it. Um, so, another thing to mention is just you have to get central venous assessed for this case. Um, do you know why you have to get central venous assessed? So what's the point of doing a central line in general? For long-term assess, because you don't want to keep poking the patient and you, there's a higher risk of infection, IV side infection. So you, you want to have a central line and also other reason if you want to administer um, PRN, nutrition or antibiotics or chemo drugs or anything, it will cause it will cause a lot of significant like thrombophilitis, inflammation of your veins if you do it in a peripheral site. So that's why you have to do a central line. And these babies are generally just really sick for a long period of time, even after surgery. So they need a central venous line to continue with the PRN and into antibodies. Um, have a read up about central line, the difference between central line, PIC and Higgins, because it's not, it's quite fully taught in um, Monash, but um, when you go onto the wards, everyone expects you to kind of know it. Um, the last procedure, you don't have to know, but um, just for people who are interested, there are four main things, which is really is really easy to remember. So you know last band, division of last band, reduction, basically putting putting everything together, untwist the bubbles, placement small bar on the right, large bar on the left. <coughs> do you know why do you have to do this? Basically, if you don't do this, you're not gonna. Next time when you do an abnormal X-ray, it's gonna look so messy for the next doctor who treat it. They won't know what's the normal anatomy on this baby. So you just have to put small bar on the right, left, uh, large bar on the left. So they will know the anatomy and just do the appendectomy for the same purpose, uh, same purpose because if you have a pain, you don't know whether it's appendicitis or not. So might as well just cut it off. So for all things, very easy to remember. Is that the patient's right? Patients, patient, yeah. Okay, so the next person, you want to give me a brief summary? Um, sure. So this is a qualification of the caused by the lab span, which yep. is 
Yep. Sika and uh, Peritoneum. Yep, perfect. Yep, perfect. Um, it's very and contrast animal is a definite diagnosis. And um, what's the rotation? What direction and how? What degree? It's supposed to be two centimeters. Two centimeters. Yep, perfect. Perfect. Um, this is not gonna. I'm not gonna test you because the next person. Do you know what? <coughs> okay, actually, I'm asking you. Um, what diagnosis is this? Have you done Pete's? Okay, don't worry. Then, um, can someone tell me what is this? For those who have done Pete's. Sorry? And Valacil. So <coughs> everyone probably thinking on Valacil and gastroschisis. And the question is which one's which? This one? On Valacil? Why? Yep. So um, examples or on policy? I think they like to call examples, but it doesn't matter. So gastroschisis, so both of them basically is a abdominal wall defect causing a herniation of all your bowels. It looks really um, traumatic. It looks like the baby is going to die, but in fact, most of the baby can be saved. And um, I'm not going to test you, just going to show you. Um, with sac, with ball sac, the frequency, the incidence, um, so what you have to know is that examples has a genetic component and it's associated with most structural abnormality and Down syndrome, backward vitamin syndrome, you can read it off as well. And um, other structural, and, uh, structural abnormalities you can get, including these, oh, these things. And for gastroschisis, although it looks more disgusting and it's not protected by a sac, you're expecting the kids will get more infections, get a, a lot of complication, might die easily. In fact, it actually has a better prognosis because they're not associated with other um, congenital abnormalities. So what you do is you manage it conservatively and you wait for the baby to grow to an appropriate size and then you just put everything back together uh, to into the um, abdominal wall and fix it. And um, during the period of conservative management, you have to manage this wound, which is essentially your bowel. And this is another baby that I saw in um, MMC. And um, guess, does anyone know what this is? As in, um, what structure is this? So it's actually the liver that is sitting outside the baby. And you can see how massive this liver is compared to the size of the baby. So we do have to wait for a fairly long time for the baby to grow to an appropriate size, and then we'll push back the um, liver into the baby. <clears throat> uh, okay, can't be bothered asking you. Basically, in summary, examples is the one that sort of looks okay, but with no more abnormalities, poor long-term prognosis, and gastroschisis is more like the other way around. Do you think you need a brick tank? Five minutes break time. No need. Go on. What time is it? Should we move on? Okay, just move on. <laughs> um, so next baby. Um, <clears throat> nine-year-old boy. Uh, we start with front row, maybe. Presented with acute severe low abdominal pain, nausea, new history of surgery, trauma, sick looking, growed up. I don't want to solve non tender. Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about think lower down? If I tell you this pain is a referred pain. Yep, so it's a testicular torsion. <laughs> so the next question can you describe to me what you see here? As a penis, I know. Yep. So erythematous looking scrotum with um, reduced um, 
graphite, like those lines, skin lines, and swollen, as you said. Yeah, it might be hard to preach it on the screen, sorry. Okay, so it's a surgical emergency. <laughs> you can save billions of lives, so you definitely have to save it. And the most important thing to know is it's gonna be irreversible after eight to 12 hours. So this kid present to emergency department and telling you that, oh, I've been having this pain for six, uh, for seven hours on um, 15 minutes. She just have to call the surgeons and have to rush the theater immediately. Um, so if you, if you are not sure, always call the surgical registrar or always, you know, treat it, surgical manage it, surgical manage it instead of not managing it. Um, Pig is eight to 14 years old. So fortunately, all guys are already passed through that page. Yes. <laughs> um, so signs and symptoms, acute onset abdominal or groin pain is really, really tender. And on examination, although it's tender, you still have to pop it, you can feel that it's a bit higher than the other side that is not inflamed. Um, and absent chromosteric reflex. So what is chromosteric reflex? This person? Yeah. Oh, wow, you know this. Have you done this before? <laughs> <laughs> On a patient. <laughs> yep. So basically, you, you get lack of this reflex because um, the whole cord, the surrounding cord, um, together with the nurses, twists. Twist. Um, and it's more common on the left side than the right side. So they're intravaginal and extravaginal. And um, 90% of them are intravaginal and only a tiny portion of them extravaginal. And you only see the extravaginal in really tiny, small babies because they are tunica vaginalis. It's not sort of um, attached it with the surrounding tissue. Whereas um, when you grow a bit older, you actually get a bit of attachment of your tunica vaginalis with the scrotum. So it doesn't twist. So what twist is inside within it? Investigate by um, Doppler ultrasound. Do look at the blood flows because obviously twisted, you have a reduced blood flow. You see enlarged the echogenic and low vascularity of the epididymis. And management by nail by mouth because um, you have to do surgery, so obviously nail by mouth and surgical detoxion fixation. Okay, next person, do you want to give me a brief summary of what vesicular detoxion is? Just main points, passwords. Um, okay. One thing that is the most important time frame, what's the time frame? It's as well about yeah. That's all you have to know about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the next person, what do you see? Yeah. Same presentation. Uh, not same, very similar presentation. <laughs> so describe to me what you see. I see a picture of a male genitalia in the testes. Yep. The testes, the right one is lower than the left. Yep. It's quite normal. Yep. Online skin looks normal from what I see. Yep. And, um, as well. Yep. What else? Can you take a lot to Yeah, yeah, I think I should do that. <laughs> can you appreciate the left side? Yeah, I can see that. Yep. And do you know what that is? So basically, there's something called an appendage. That's appendix testes. So appendix is anything that is useless. So it's something useless of the testes. So you basically get a really small bulging, like a embryological remnant of your testes. And this 